We'll move on now to the invited talk by Max Riabinin, the research scientist at Yandex. And prior to that, it was with the Higher School of Economics, HSC University in Moscow. Welcome. Yeah. Hey, guys. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Okay. I can just start sharing the screen. Uh, Max, is it okay with you to record this uh, this talk? Yeah, definitely. Great, thanks. Great. So, just a second. And now you should be able to see the slides, right? Yes, that's yeah, perfect. Okay, that's great. Uh, so, yeah, uh, hello everybody. My name is Maxi Bean. Uh, thanks for the introduction. I'm actually, uh, like, I was not previously affiliated with the HC University. I'm currently both a research scientist and um, undergoing my PhD yeah. studies at the Hello university. <laughs> so, oh yeah. Uh, so basically, the topic of my talk is going to be on decentralized deep learning, and uh, the subtitle is "How to Train Large Networks Together." Let's just uh, elaborate on that uh, word "together." Uh, Basically, the idea that uh, we wanted to uh, expand on in our research is that, uh, well, if you have a look at deep learning in 2021, you see one uh, major scaling trend, which has been going on for uh, like uh, several past years. Basically, large scale training on larger models on larger data sets becomes ever more popular. Uh, and as you can see on the plot on the right, uh, the model size for largest language models of today is exceeding hundreds of billions. And uh, maybe a couple of years ago, or like in 2018, it was uh, only hundreds of millions of parameters. And also, obviously, the data sets sizes have been growing as well. Uh, well, why do we do this? Basically, because of all the uh, benefits that large, larger models bring to us. For instance, uh, OpenAI in one of their works, uh, or actually more than one work, uh, have uh, highlighted those scaling laws of language models that uh, basically uh, can be summarized as follows. Uh, larger models are more simple efficient and they, in the sense that they need uh, actually less train iterations and uh, sometimes even less examples to converge to the same quality. And as shown by the GPT-3 paper and uh, all the following work, these models also have zero-shot properties, which are quite unique and uh, useful in practice. So what does this mean for the average practitioner? Well, uh, there is one issue that comes with scaling. Uh, it is the issue of resource costs, because some of the mo those models costs, uh, cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to train because of the need to uh, build uh, expensive supercomputers or HPC clusters uh, and to actually launch all these experiments because uh, those models do not fit any single uh, hardware accelerator. So you need to build uh, those uh, uh, hundreds to thousands of nodes and to well acquire those uh, hundreds to thousands of GPUs. Uh, for instance, GPT-3 training was estimated to cost tens of millions of dollars. And uh, well, obviously it might be feasible right now to train uh, a model which is uh, 100 to maybe 300 billions of parameters or even to 1 billion parameters, but train uh, a 100 billion parameter model is quite infeasible for an average researcher or uh, a university or maybe an independent uh, organization. Uh, so this issue might, might slightly, uh, uh, harm the uh, scientific progress in the field because, uh, first of all, not all of the uh, state of the art results are openly available. And uh, furthermore, uh, it's difficult to analyze and to extend the current best approaches if you uh, don't have such resources to train uh, those models and to basically replicate the studies from those papers. So, what can you do about it? Uh, in our work, we explore the solution that has been proposed and validated in other areas of science, uh, such as uh, high, energy, uh, high energy physics, uh, bioinformatics, and others. Basically, uh, it can be summarized as volunteer computation, and uh, its idea is, 
Well, uh, if we don't have a supercomputer in our hands, why not just use the idle resources of volunteers who would like to donate their idle uh, compute uh, to uh, advance in the scientific progress? Or just uh, why not just train something with our friends? Uh, so with that said, uh, building volunteer computing uh, in the context of distributed deep learning is quite difficult because uh, all those tasks have uh, several uh, specific uh, features uh, or uh, several specific details that we uh, need to be mindful of. Uh, first of all, it's the issue of frequent node failures or just uh, inconsistent participations because uh, some of the people might not uh, be a part of your experiment uh, at all times they might just uh, join uh, your training for like two hours or even less uh, then train your, uh, train your model for a couple of hours and leave and this uh, continues as long as you train the model because not everybody wants to like uh, use this the, the resources for this specific purpose sorry just a second uh, then there's the issue of communication over internet because it's magnitude slower than in the case of HPC clusters and obviously uh, regular distributed training uh, procedures have been designed with uh, this speed of communication in mind mostly uh, next there's the issue of heterogeneous hardware because uh, in a cluster you have more or less a uniform uh, um, infrastructure in the sense that you have uh, GPUs of uh, the same type and the connection speeds are basically uniform. But if you're trying to train across a broader collaboration of people who might join from different uh, computers from uh, different countries even and from uh, different cloud providers, for instance, it becomes more difficult. So, and if we uh, have a brief look at the existing approaches for distributed deep learning, we uh, might observe that while well, some of them are pretty efficient in terms of throughput, in terms of uh, scalability, uh, by which we understand the communication efficiency. Uh, but for instance, uh, some of them, such as data parallel training, do not allow us to train a larger model that can uh, be the size of the entire collaboration uh, or the entire system in our setup. Uh, some of them are pretty uh, sensitive to the network latency and bandwidth and uh, as such not very suitable to our setup. And uh, thus we decided to uh, explore this field uh, a bit deeper and to try to come up with our own approaches. And uh, in this talk, I'll overview some of the papers in this field. Uh, so one uh, of the papers that we have published at NeurIPS 20 which is called Learning at Home Towards cross source Training of Large Neural Networks Using Decentralized Mixture of Experts. I'm sorry, the names uh, will get uh, shorter by the end of the talk. Uh, and this uh, uh, work, uh, we try to basically cover uh, the foundational question. Uh, basically, how do you train a large model which uh, encompasses the entire uh, system of uh, volunteer devices uh, in an efficient manner? And uh, the solution that we came up with was that it's not uh, entirely possible, well, it, it, it was not at that time, uh, to uh, train a model of a general architecture. But uh, if you're willing to uh, make some modifications in a model, uh, some very simple ones, it becomes uh, more fault tolerant uh, and more robust to those inf uh, infrequent inconsistent particip uh, participation issues that we highlighted. Basically, uh, the uh, architecture can be summarized in this picture. Uh, you have uh, one uh, large model, which is separated into several uh, small uh, sublayers. Uh, these are called experts and are um, uh, uh, queried in parallel for each layer of your neural network. Uh, then, if uh, you want to access one uh, specific expert of your network, you address it via something called a distributed hash table. This is uh, a very useful data structure, which uh, might be uh, 
which you might know about if you've ever used uh, technologies such as BitTorrent. Uh, let us dive uh, in a bit deeper into the decentralized mixture of experts layer, uh, which is the core part of uh, this proposed uh, uh, system. Basically, the idea is as follows. Imagine that you have uh, one single layer of, new, of your neural network, and you have the inputs to this layer, which might be the, just the input of your model or the activations from the previous layer. Uh, and instead of one uh, co copy of your parameters, you have multiple, and the, these are called experts. Uh, the architecture, this architectural trick itself is pretty popular nowadays in large scale deep learning. So basically, uh, when you have those experts, uh, you do not query all of them. You do not need to access uh, uh, all parts of uh, this layer. You just need to access a small subset of them. For instance, three in this case. Uh, the key difference between regular mixture of experts and decentralized mixture of experts is that uh, all of those uh, uh, parts of your network are located uh, on different peers, on different comp computers, basically. And uh, as such, we can uh, easily uh, scale the model horizontally uh, by just increasing the, the number of uh, those experts. Basically, as the participants join, they can just uh, be assigned uh, different experts. Uh, then we just need to locate uh, those peers via the uh, distributed hash, hash table. Uh, and then uh, as we query them, uh, we just uh, obtain our output by averaging all the outputs from those experts with their weights. Uh, the, uh, uh, the major benefit of this architecture is that it is very fault tolerant in the sense that uh, you can just uh, choose the, your experts with the gig function, locate those workers, and then you send the inputs, for instance, from a different process, from a different computer. Uh, then, as you execute a forward pass, uh, some of those experts might not respond. For instance, uh, they might be a network failure, uh, they might just disconnect from your experiment, and, uh, well, what, whatever, for whatever reasons, they just stop responding to us. Uh, that's not an issue because we can simply uh, aggregate the outputs of responding experts and average them. And on the backward pass, uh, as we have computed the loss and uh, pass the gradients to this layer, we just send the inputs and gradients. Uh, we need to send the inputs to recompute the gradients uh, for a technique called gradient chip pointing. Uh, at this stage, uh, some experts might also not respond to us. And we just need to update the parameters of those experts who have responded to us. That's it, basically. Uh, now, uh, this technique is actually pretty useful, but it does not, uh, uh, well, first, it requires uh, some architectural modifications in order to be very efficient. And second, it does not work for some of the layers of your model. For instance, the gating function that uh, chooses which uh, that decides which experts to choose. And also uh, the embedding player, which is located on the uh, train uh, processes. Uh, then we need uh, to use something different. And for this, we devised a different optimization uh, algorithm, which we called Moshpit SDG and published at this new episode. So basically you can uh, meet us up at the poster session if, we, if you'd like to. Uh, so, the idea of this work is to basically solve the issue of uh, averaging uh, of your parameters or uh, gradients mm -hmm. in case of distributed training uh, uh, across a decentralized network. Uh, basically, we propose a new algorithm for decentralized uh, already used like averaging, which is used widely uh, 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 in data parallel training, uh, for instance, even in regular PyTorch. Uh, and its main idea is that we do not average across the entire group mm -hmm. in one iteration, mm -hmm. but we average in smaller non-overlapping groups. And it turns out that this algorithm mm -hmm. is first communication efficient, just like all reviews, mm -hmm. and fault tolerant, and useful even on its own. So it does not need you. Uh, it, yeah, it does not require you to make any significant modifications into the model that you would like to train. Uh, for the core idea, let's just have a look at the following slides. Uh, basically, imagine that I have nine GPUs, uh, or like uh, which correspond to nine training processes. Basically, they are all trying to train the same model on different subsets of data. 
for instance. And we would like to average the gradients. Uh, now, instead of averaging all of them in one pass, we first uh, separate them into three groups across the vertical axis, and then average into these groups only. And then at the next iteration, we average uh, across the horizontal axis. And uh, well, simple arithmetics uh, proves, uh, shows us that uh, the result of the averaging should be uh, equivalent to uh, regular all reviews. But the uh, important difference is that if some of the peers decide not to respond to requests at uh, any uh, single point in time, for instance, the one below, then it does not significantly uh, harm the convergence uh, of, and it does not well interrupt the entire averaging procedure. Uh, because uh, in the uh, upper and the middle groups, uh, the averaging will uh, successfully finish. So for the experiments in this paper, we've uh, conducted several distributed training grounds of uh, image classification models, uh, specifically ResNet50 on ImageNet, and of uh, language models. Uh, in this case, it was Albert Lodge on the Book Corpus uh, data set. So as you can see, we've compared with multiple data parallel training approaches, including some, uh, uh, some well, uh, quite uh, quite strong baselines such as stochastic gradient push, which uh, is uh, not reliant on techniques like all use, but uh, is still but is widely uh, used used in the decentralized setup. Uh, and basically, uh, you can see that in the homogeneous setup, where well, uh, nothing uh, significant needs, needs to be done, all reduce is still a very good baseline. But if you're trying to use a heterogeneous setup, uh, first of all, uh, all reduce uh, may fall behind. And Marsh Peter DG, due to its communication efficiency properties, uh, can outperform these baselines. Also, in the case of uh, Albert portraying, uh, it turned out that uh, the convergence speed uh, in terms of uh, real time was uh, even faster uh, than using a, a homogeneous uh, high-speed uh, server with multiple GPUs. Um, basically, we used only preemptible instances and some uh, common marketplace, uh, GPU marketplace devices. And we uh, turned out to uh, outperform this uh, more expensive setup at uh, a fraction of its cost. Uh, well, this protocol also has some favorable technical, uh, some favorable uh, theoretical properties. For instance, for the averaging, the procedure converges exponentially quickly. And for the Moshpit SDG, the actual distributed uh, uh, optimization protocol, the results uh, are equivalent to local SDG, which is a, a very popular uh, distributed optimization method in some mild assumptions. I won't stop uh, here like for a very long time, but just uh, for your information. Uh, now for the next paper, uh, which is called Distributed Deep Learning you know, Open Collaborations, uh, also published at this year's EURIPS, we wanted to uh, tackle the following question. Uh, how do scale, uh, scale decentralized training to real life scenarios? Because um, there exist not only theoretical questions, but practical ones. For instance, we need to be mindful of the natural conditions of participants. Because as I said previously, uh, the network speeds of some of the devices uh, may, be, may be significantly faster than those of the others. And we propose an averaging algorithm that dynamically adapts to the network conditions of the devices that you run it on. Basically, it's um, an adaptive method which uh, plugs in the uh, bandwidth of uh, all of your participating servers into a linear programming pro problem that uh, outputs the fractions of the gradient vector that uh, each peer needs to average. And it turns out that in some special cases, uh, such as equal bandwidth or just one very fast uh, uh, peer in the network, it re recovers regular dis distributed methods such as all reduce or parameter server. Uh, but in um, uh, more frequently uh, occurring heterogeneous setup, it can it can recover some hybrid uh, distributed uh, methods. So 
basically uh it's uh, it, it, well basically because of its uh, adaptive properties uh, now for training uh, we simply adopt large patch SDG as used for all of the large models nowadays and the uh, main advantage of uh, this large batch optimization is that we can accumulate uh, small uh, batches on peers and synchronize across the entire collaboration with methods such as Moshpit SDG, for example, when the target batch size is reached. And uh, if some of the peers uh, uh, drop from the uh, collaboration, for instance, the fourth one on the picture, uh, it doesn't matter to us uh, because we can just uh, compensate for that with all other peers, with the example, uh, assuming that all the workers sample from this, the same data set. And if uh, new peers join, uh, you uh, simply aggregate the uh, target batch size faster. Now for the experiment in this setup, uh, we actually ran a collaborative uh, experiment with a language model on the Bengali language. Uh, it was called Sakash Bird, and we uh, enlisted the help of uh, 40 volunteers from the NeuroPark community. And basically, the model uh, was Albert Large, and we reached the results that are competitive to state of the art uh, trained on clusters. Uh, and as you can see, uh, well, first of all, in terms of the results, uh, the largest one uh, outperformed all the baselines, and uh, participants used uh, their own servers and even some collab, Kaggle uh, instances with GPUs or even TPUs. Uh, so I think uh, I'm running slightly, slightly out of time, but let me just briefly say, uh, mention another work, which is currently a preprint, but still publicly available. Uh, basically, it uh, tries to tackle the issue of uh, training securely uh, in this uh, distributed collaborations. Basically, the idea is that we can use uh, some techniques from multi-party computation uh, to re uh, remove redundant uh, computations, but still verify the results of those malicious peers. Uh, this uh, allows us to achieve some degree of business intolerance. Now, uh, if you would like to know, know more, we have uh, a blog post uh, at the Hugging Face blog, which is called Deploying Over the Internet. And right now we have a demonstration at New Rips, which is called Turning Transforms Together. Uh, it's going to be uh, this evening. And uh, well, we have uh, several links on our research and the publications. Uh, thanks. I think it's time to pass to the questions. Many thanks, Max, for the excellent talk. Uh, we have, I think we're going to eat into the break a little bit, at least we can take a question. So there were a couple of questions, in fact, in the chat. I'm going to go with the last one. Uh, so the question was about the assumptions for the theorem that you mentioned on page 13. Um, so there were some concern about the uh, you know, convexity and smoothness. So if you can just clarify this point, please. Uh, yeah. The question, uh, the question was about expansion convergence, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, the, ex the expansion convergence is not actually for the uh, optimization method, but for the averaging. Uh, maybe I, I didn't say it quite clear. So for uh, the optimization procedure, we have, uh, I think I stopped sharing the screen. Let me just resume it for a second. Mm. here now it should be visible so uh for the optimization the convergence is well not expansion in terms of iterations it's uh i'm not uh, like a very uh, good specialist in optimization so uh the bulk of this work was done by my uh, colleague actually edward gorbanov uh but the core idea here is that for the averaging you can just uh, obtain this result uh where you have uh, the expected distortion, uh, which depends on the number of iterations uh, as follows um, from the equation five. And uh, from unconvex case, you reduce, uh, you obtain some uh, guarantees that are pretty comparable to the existing, uh, to the fountain, the literature. I hope that answers the question. So maybe. Uh... Okay, yeah, I, I'm, if there's any follow up, I'm sure that uh, we can follow up on that particular point. Um, the other question was about, uh, yes, yes, indeed. You answer fine. 
So the question was about the, we mentioned um, the relationship between overparametrization and sample complexity. And it seemed to be the case that the overparametrized model have a lower sample complexity. You can comment. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is actually a very interesting question, maybe a slightly uh, out of scope of uh, my expertise, but uh, as a deep learning practitioner, I'm uh, also perplexed by it because, uh, well, uh, in some cases, well, uh, first I should say that all of their results are empirically motivated, so, but not like uh, uh, replicated in the, in the total sense because uh, like uh, it's quite difficult to conduct uh, those experiments that they did at uh, the scale that they done at the scale and uh, well there is no like uh, uh, definite proof for this but uh, with the scan glows and the uh, and uh, some effects such as the double descent, I think uh, our theoretical understanding of uh, what's going on inside neural networks falls a bit behind. I, I, I hope I'm not offending anybody by this remark, but uh, well, this is something that uh, some of my uh, other colleagues have also thought. And that for the larger neural networks, we're actually entering some different uh, setup in which uh, those uh, some of those assumptions uh, they not specifically uh, hold. So yeah, uh, so some of my okay. Um, okay. Basically, some people have compared this to earlier experimental physics because well, would not have uh, definite loss, and we are having difficulties with coming up with all the theory. But the uh, evidence is there, and there is another question. A brief question, so then we can have also one question for Arlesh. Uh, so uh, the question is about the heterogeneity of node compute and network bandwidth, if you've done any experiment under those conditions. Uh, yeah, so it, uh, it was, well, uh, we compared uh, different setups in all three works. Basically, mm -hmm. I think, uh, first of all, I should mention that in the Learning at Home uh, paper, We've tested different uh, sorts of natural bandwidth. So basically, in the highest possible bandwidth, uh, there is no need to use uh, such uh, complicated techniques. Uh, simple model approaches will work just fine, as shown by well all of the popular frameworks. Um, but uh, in cases where the latency is high, you need to come up with something a bit more efficient or uh, some sacrifices for your uh, like. Uh, communication uh, or uh, uh, with uh, when trying to trade off for the uh, total bandwidth uh, for the total throughput of your config uh, of your system and uh, for the deadlock paper we've tested uh, different hardware setups for instance we tried uh, let me ju just uh, yeah uh, we've tried uh, conducting experiments with first uh, an array of heterogeneous nodes, uh, and then we tried to vary these conditions. For instance, we connected several peers who were sl uh, slightly sl slower, who uh, some peers who did not have any GPUs at all, but still were able to uh, conduct computations. And uh, so how the and we uh, tried to uh, observe how the performance. Uh, variety in those different conditions. So basically, in the it's all in the papers, but uh, I can uh, tell it uh, about it a bit more if you just write me via email or via any other uh, form of contact. Okay, thank you very much, Max, for the discussion and the presentation again.